Ben and I are here again to talk about strange encounters down under. Um, I've got a few ghost uh, cases to talk about, and Ben has had his own personal experience and some other stories to talk about. So, Ben, why don't you kick it off with your own experience? Yeah, sure thing, Cheryl. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this uh, particular episode. Uh, I think that uh, ghosts are universally very popular. Uh, every culture in the world uh, has has ghosts or, or ghostly experiences. So I think it's something that people can really connect to. So, you know, even more so than, say, something like a UFO or a Yowie, which, you know, not everybody's seen a Yowie or a UFO, but, but something always goes bump in the night. So I think that's a really, a really interesting thing and even, and even more spooky than that. So, yes, yeah, so I think this is a, a, you know, I was looking forward to getting this, uh, talking about this tonight. Uh, yeah, so when I was about 12 years old, um, uh, we lived up here in East Gippsland and, and my mum's sister's house in Bayswater in Melbourne. And we'd go down and stay there periodically over school holidays. And one time we were down there and, and all of a sudden it, it, it came out of nowhere that that this house is actually haunted. My auntie who lived there started started talking about it. And she just sort of, and, and she was very, uh, she's very nonchalant about it in, in many ways, like not not scared uh, not spiritual, just this thing is here that lives in the house with us, um, and uh, we get on with our lives basically. So that was that was her that was her attitude, which I think some people who, who live with ghosts do ultimately end up having that attitude. Mm, yes, they do. I've, yeah, I've people uh, like that too. They just oh yeah, just that's the local ghost, you know. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's the local, yeah, it's the local ghost. There he is rattling his chains again or, or you know, or, or whatever it might be. So, so, uh, so she starts talking about a few things that happen around the house and, and then it's all of a sudden they sort of go, oh, we, we, perhaps we better not, you know, like we might spook the kids or well, hang on, the kids are already spooked, you know, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, and I'll, I'll, first of all, I'll recount some of the things that, that she, that she said happened in the house. So, she, she said that um, they had a bull terrier at the time, and this would have been about 1982, 1983. Um, I was about 12. And the dog, and, I, and I've seen this with my own eyes, the dog would stand there in one particular corner and bark and growl and just go absolutely crazy in, in this one particular corner in the, in the living room. It would, just, it would just stand there and just, and, and, and like a, a bull terrier has got a fairly loud bark and they can be a fairly intimidating little dog as well. So we'd, we'd sit there and you'd watch this dog just barking and barking into the, into the corner. And so, so we saw that with, it, with our own eyes. And um, she said that, um, that, that in different rooms, you'd hear different things happening. So if you were down in the front of the house, you, it, it would sound like there was, there was people in the back of the house. So there was, a bit, there was a big pool room down the back of the house where they had a, had a billiards table. And, um, and she said, you, you'd, you'd, you'd think there was people down there and, and some sort of a, a party was going on down there. And she also said that um, one day when she, was, when she was in the bathroom, the towel on the rack started shaking violently. So the towel was just sitting on the rack and it started shaking absolutely just violently, like not, the, not, not, not a breeze coming through, you know, not even a gale force wind coming through. This, this, this towel just started going absolutely crazy all on its own. And, and, and I thought, oh, that would have been enough to send me running out of the house. Yeah, me too. Um, but, she was, but she was very, you know, very lackadaisical about it. And one particular day, um, for whatever reason, my mum and sister and my auntie were going somewhere and I was left alone in the house. And, um, and I was sitting there in the lounge room and sure enough, I could hear down the back like there was people in the back room where the billiard table was. I could, I could feel sort of like people, footsteps walking around down there. And I sort of, you know, and the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I, and I kind of like looked down the corridor 
and I couldn't see anything. I was not quite game enough to go down there. This would have been probably about 3.30 in the afternoon, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I wasn't quite game enough to walk down there. And so anyway, so I go back and sit down in front of the TV again. And then I hear, in the, and it had timber floors. And then I hear in the, in the hallway, tromp, 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 tromp. Someone's walking from the, from the, the pool room at the back, coming straight down the hallway. And I'm the only person in the house. Well, I just freaked and I just yeah. ran out of the house and I, and I waited outside <laughs> until uh, my mum and uh, auntie and my sister came back. And um, so for me, that was, that was my experience with, with, with ghosts. It was a very sort of, um, it, was, it was a shocking experience, but, but I didn't see an apparition. I didn't see anyone at all, but there was something there uh, on, on that day and obviously any other time as well that was living there, you know, and people could say, oh, it could be pipes knocking or, you know, or there could be rats in the ceiling that the dog's hearing and you could go through a whole range of rational explanations and I'd sit there and go, yes, 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 that's right. We'd have to check for rats and yes, yes, yes. We'd have to go underneath and check the, check the pipes and make sure they're not, they're not banging around down there. But the meter and the pacing and the, 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 the sound of, of, of it covering distance it's not, it's not some pipe banging underneath the house that's just, you know, I've heard water pipes bang before, I've, you know, live with water pumps and stuff and you hear all these things under. So, you know, you know, a household noise, mm. you know, it, it, even in a house that you don't live, like that you don't necessarily live in, you, you still have a certain idea on what you should expect when you're actually in that house. Yeah. And for, and for me, that was, that was an experience. And it wasn't, it was not just the sound. It was also, you, you get that feeling of a presence yeah. or presences. Yeah. So, you know, so when I was, sort of could hear that back in the back bedroom, there was, it sounded like there was people back there, you know, like more than one, they're walking around the pool table and, and you know, walking around in that room in the distance. And then, then these footsteps come, actively come walking down the hallway. <laughs> that was enough to give me the, um, give me the chills. And, and some people said, do you believe in ghosts? And I go, yeah, well, I believe in something, you know, I believe in something, you know, what it is, I don't know. Um, you know, and you can take a spiritual view or a non-spiritual view or, you know, anywhere in between. But that's my story to kick this into gear. <laughs> How old were you at the time? I was about 12 or 13. Yeah, right. Yeah, I was. I remember Michael Jackson's Thriller was, was popular. <laughs> I remember Prince's Purple Rain. They were the albums that she had at that time. So it was, would have been somewhere around then. So did you ever, when you're in the house, did you ever sort of, um, notice one of the common things that people report is any sort of cold spots in the house? Uh, I, I can't recall that now specifically, mm. but but I'm sure that that possibly was there at mm. that time because this this was this house was a um, like a uh, cedar house or something like that and it, and it was sort of like blacks painted with stain like mm. like you know like weatherboards painted but painted with stain yeah. probably built in the um, in the 70s maybe. Um, but who knows what was there in previous to that? I mean, yeah. you know, anything's possible. And, and, and Bayswater is in the foothills of, the, of Mount Dandenong. So Mount Dandenong's big mountain range back there. Yeah. So, so the other strange thing, like, and every time we went there, every time we went there after I had the experience, I just had this feeling of dread. Every time we went there, it's this absolute feeling of dread. I never liked being in there, in that house after, after I'd had, had that experience. And of course you tell your mum and it's just like, oh, well, don't, don't worry about it. You know, it's just, you know, it's no, no big deal, you know, and you do move on, but, but the other thing that sort of amped that up was at that time too, um, or around that time, there was advertising for, for Stephen King's movie Creep Show, and and that was running on the TV, and and so you've got that, and you've got this house which is really strange, and it was just had this whole weird atmosphere there. Yeah. So was there? Did your aunt know of any history of something taking place there? Any murders or um, no? No, didn't know that no didn't didn't know that no no didn't I didn't know any any previous history on the house to say yeah. that ah oh, look guys yeah drug deal went bad here back in the 70s and three people got shot in the back room no didn't have any any of that sort of that sort of back history but um well that, oh, that you're aware of that I'm aware of yeah, yeah. exactly yeah yeah not to say yeah. that yeah I was going to say it's quite it's it, I find that when uh, you investigate these locations that there is often something like that has happened in the background or, or some sort of terrible disaster or something like that. 
Um, and actually, that's that sort of is a segue into the case that I wanted to talk about in Brisbane at the um, about the Archerfield Airfield ghost. And uh, it, it was it was about 2019. I was co-hosting the weekly Strange Encounters radio show, and I came in contact with uh, Liam Baker from the Haunts of Brisbane, and I was looking into the the Archerfield ghost story, and um, my co-host around the same time, I think, had made contact with Liam, who'd already done some background research into the case and wrote about it on his blog. So we decided to meet at the Archerfield Airfield and record a show from the site. Um, but just to give a bit of a backstory about that, um, for some time, the airfield was the primary airport in Brisbane. Uh, and during World War II, it was used as a Royal Australian Air Force Station. So Liam's background research into the ghost story uh, revealed that on the 26th of March, 1943, uh, a C-47 Douglas Dakota touched down at Archerfield Aerodrome after having taken off from Townsville, Queensland early in the day, loaded with radar equipment and that sort of thing destined for Sydney. But anyway, upon landing, both the pilot and the flight engineer advised the ground crew that the plane merely required refuelling uh, which was carried out and the aircraft was hangered. Now, at 5 a.m. the next morning, uh, under cover of, of the crew, sorry, uh, the crew of four took charge of the machine and they carried out a very brief pre flight check in anticipation of completing their final run to Sydney. But anyway, the, so the C 47 taxied out towards the runway, stopping briefly to take on board 19 passengers um, who had waited. You know, into the pre-dawn. And these included two US Army personnel, one was a major, uh, an Australian Army Lieutenant, 13 RAAF personnel who were mostly signal staff uh, from Townsville, and three unauthorised WAF personnel who had um, convinced the pilot to take them to Sydney. So anyway, they, they um, um, what happened was uh, while the passengers, they all embarked, a Lockheed took advantage of the available runway and accelerated down the flare path, only to abort the takeoff and return to the hangars. Meanwhile, a thick fog bank ha had developed at the southern end of the airfield runway. Um, so they're all anxious to get in the air anyway. So the C-47 accelerated down the runway following the flare trail at 5.11 a.m. And they radioed through to the control tower as they left the ground with a simple message, departed now. Uh, and then they just disappeared into the fog bank. Then at 5.15 a.m., the air aircraft careened into the bush just south of the airfield and slammed into the ground in a ball of fire. Um, and, uh, yeah, boom. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, they all died. Everyone died. So, um, and what had happened was after crossing the southern boundary of the airfield, the plane had banked steeply to the left. Uh, and the left wing tip had come in contact with the top of a tree, shearing through the wing and dragging the plane over into a nose down position, boom, play on the aircraft into the undergrowth. Anyway, um, so it went down as the uh, Australia's worst air disaster in history at the time. Yeah. But after that, over the years, locals have spotted people in flight gear walking along the road near the airfield. Now, right. some years previously, Liam had interviewed an old ex-pilot who had seen what was later described as the Archerfield ghost, or came to be known as the Archerfield ghost. And the, the ex-pilot stated, he said, I was walking across one of the airfields on my way back to a group of friends when I spotted a man dressed in what appeared to be World War II flight gear. Mm -hmm. And he said he could remember him vividly right down to his flight jacket, his goggles, his cap. Um, now, at the time, there are a number of wartime aviation buffs visiting the airfield, and he thought nothing of it. He thought, oh, maybe someone's getting into the spirit of things by turning up in costume. So anyway, he passed it. They passed each other, and the guy in the flight gear acknowledged him with a gesture and a nod, as he did to him, and he continued to walk back to rejoin his friends. When he arrived back, he asked his colleagues who the guy was in the World War II flight gear. Uh, and, of course, there was no one there dressed up like that that day. Mm -hmm. There wasn't. So that's when he became aware of the, um, 
the Archerfield ghost. And since then, locals have seen um, that person walking up and down the road next to the airfield, mm. uh, uh, dressed in all the gear, on and off, you know, not all the time, but on and off over the years, people mm. have reported seeing this person. Mm. And, and the question, I think, is that, you know, like these types of incidents, um, they seem to be like they around tragic situations where people um, see ghosts and their murders, suicides, disasters, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, when people dig into the past of those locations where hauntings are reported, they find this type of history. Yeah. So, so I guess the question is, um, you know, is it the the um, the intensity of the experience that sort of leaves that Im energetic imprint in the ethers or the the um, shadow of the energy of the people who died in the area? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's. I think it has to be something like that because I, it, it's got to be because. I don't think it's, I don't think that's any example of like a trapped spirit or something like that. You know, I think, I think an event can occur. It has, it's, it's a, it's a high intensity event of, of emotion. So you could say murdered, suicide, um, you know, anything like that. Um, and it's, and in certain instances, it's enough to leave a lasting impression in, in a location. Mm. um and something like a fiery crash with a plane yes you would you would definitely think that, that would be that would be possible um rather than it being um you know like and, and maybe attachment as well so like if you know you say an old house and the old lady who lived here and, and you see her walking up and down the stairs so maybe that maybe attachment can also mm. link you to link you to a place or link an link a a uh, an aspect of your energy to a place rather than than you being spiritually trapped in 13 smith street you know yeah. smithfield you know i yeah. think that 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 people can leave some people animals or you know all sorts of any any living creature potentially can leave that sort of impression because they talk about do you know, ghost dogs and ghost horses and that sort of thing so yeah i think it's i think that's very possible that's a good example of that yeah, and, and like I know of uh, a clairvoyant medium who, and I know of various mediums who do this sort of work of house clearing where there are, you know, um, ghosts are actually walking through the uh, properties, whether it's a house or some sort of property, and um, they're, um, the medium themselves will take on the last moment experiences of the person who's been died, mm. who's been died, who's died, uh, and say that there was a hanging and they can walk around, they can feel that their throat's getting tired or if they've been stabbed, they can feel it in their shoulder, you know, like, and they can pick up. And when people, the owners of the property go and look at the history of the, of the house, they mm. find that this has actually happened. Mm. That's mm. fascinating to me. Yeah, that's that sort of it validates that um, you know that, that that's the, the psychic, doesn't it? When 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 in that instance where where someone has has a true a gift like that, um, as opposed to fishing and guessing and all that sort of stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, you know that's 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 very very impressive. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, and the other thing I find so interesting too is the fact that when a, a ghost can appear solid. Yes. Solid and as and as flesh and blood as as you and you and me having this conversation here. When 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 a ghost can appear solid, acknowledge you as you pass the ghost, uh, interact with you, and then disappear, rather than it being just purely a um, you know a, a shade or a spectral type of a of an appearance. So there's something different going on there too. Yeah. Yeah. You know what mm -hmm. that is. I don't I don't know 100 what that is, but but you can see yeah it was spectral. Uh, it was a feeling. It was the, the ghost was as solid, as real as you or me. There's a whole range of ways that it can manifest. Mm, mm. Mm. So, so you've got a, a couple of cases to talk about. Yeah, yeah, and just uh, sort of, yeah, so, sort of dovetails rather nicely with with that in some ways. But I'm sort of going to go down another another way where um, ghosts that have appeared after murders. I think that's really, really very interesting where a departed spirit is looking for some sort of justice. Uh, and perhaps that justice isn't found through the, uh, through the, through the, through the legal process, potentially, uh, you know, like, as in like the, the, the killer's not convicted. So for some reason, a, an entity can appear 
And this one's really famous. It's an, it's, an, it's an old, famous Australian ghost story. And and I remember hearing this when I was when I was very young, and I thought it's a perfect opportunity to to mention it tonight. And it's known as Fisher's Ghost. And it was in Campbelltown, New South Wales, for where an Australian farmer, Frederick Fisher, was born on the 28th of August, 1792, in London, England. And he disappeared on the 17th of June, 1826. So it's going back a fair way in Australia's colonial history. And a neighbouring farmer uh, called George Worrell claimed that the vacant farm, he claimed that he claimed the, the vacant farm on the basis of a letter he alleged to have received from Mr. Fisher, um, stating that he would not be returning to Australia and was therefore handing ownership of his farm over to Mr. Worrell. Hmm, sounds rather suspicious, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> and uh, several months later, a well-respected local named John Farley claimed to have seen a ghost pointing to a paddock beyond a nearby creek. And he claimed that the ghost was Fred Fisher, the man who had disappeared. Um, and he said that the ghost did not utter a single word, but simply pointed to the paddock before disappearing. Oh, spooky. Then, <laughs> yeah, very spooky. I love it. I can, I can see it happening, you know. Was he spectral? Was he solid? Doesn't quite go into that, that level of detail. Um, and Mr. Fisher's, Mr. Fisher's initial disappearance was unexpected and raised questions of his whereabouts. So it was, it was under suspicious circumstances, which in turn did then prompt a police search. And sure enough, his remains were discovered in the paddock beyond the creek that the alleged ghost had pointed to. And police records don't acknowledge John Farley's ghost story, but the creek where Mr. Fisher's body was recovered is still to refer to to this day as Fisher's Ghost Creek. Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting, interesting story. And that ghost was the inspiration for a 1924 silent film of the same name depicting the events surrounding Mr. Fisher's murder and the story of his demise is still commemorated by the locals. Mm -hmm. And the Festival of Fisher's Ghost is a 10 day annual event that dates back to 1956 and it's run by the Campbelltown City Council to promote unity through a variety of creative activities such as fireworks, carnivals, exhibitions, live music, street fairs and fun runs. So that all came out of a, of a ghost story from uh, 17, sorry, from 1826. Wow. But it's an interesting story because, you know, here is, here is someone who's been murdered. Um, he's been, you know, presumably been, been, you know, cheated out of his life and out of his property and the ghost simply appears, points his finger, and the rest is sort of done. Yeah, so, yeah interesting. It's like it, the intensity, I'm just thinking while you're talking, the intensity of the death experience or the situation surrounding it. Um, I mean, I've heard of, um, and I know myself, I've had experiences uh, where, where trauma has sort of seemingly opened that portal to the paranormal. And I think that mm. that that um, echo from the past that stays around locations, um, it's so strong, but mediums themselves are, are very attuned to that sort of energetic frequency or that energetic mm. echo of that experience. Mm. They seem to have these micro skills that they can pick up on that on that echo. Mm, mm. And you look at and, and John Farley, the guy who who happened to be, you know, walking in that area, mm. um, and, and it was several months after the actual disappearance. So, you know, so this ghost didn't appear a day after. This, this is several months. You know, this could be two, could be three months, something like that. And um, and this guy's been in that location, and this thing uh, appears before him, and uh, momentarily, and and as far as we know, it only appeared once to one person. So, mm. does that say something about maybe Fred Fisher had some type of ability? Mm, you know mm. that's that's a, it's an interesting point isn't it yeah so actually another case that sort of ties in with that about the intensity around death uh and and attachment to location which you brought up is the ascot house ghost in toowoomba mm -hmm. and toowoomba is uh about 45 minutes or maybe an hour west of brisbane um, and it involves a woman called Lois Jackman who bought Ascot House in 1984 to restore it. Anyway, but while she was doing that, she soon realised that the damn thing was haunted. <laughs> when she, <laughs> she began hearing strange noises. She discovered the presence of a coal spot on a wall, which is what I was talking about before. Yeah. And she saw an apparition. And the whole situation, she's thinking, oh, my God, what's going on here? 
It led her to begin inquiring into the history of the house, thankfully, because it brought up a lot of information. Um, but through her inquiry, she found that there had been a housemaid who had committed suicide on the 24th of July, 1891. Mm. And the housemaid's name was Maggie Hume. At the time, she was 23. And she was employed by the local storekeeper and politician, Frederick Holberton. Um, well, it was reported around her death that Maggie took three uh, strychnine tab, uh, capsules uh, and, of course, she died. And was dis uh, she was discovered when the owners of the Ascot house were away. And it was assumed that she did this because she became pregnant and was unmarried at the time. And you can imagine in 1891, you know, mm -hmm. the stigma around all of that. Mm. That's a big no-no. No, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, curiously, um, really strangely, actually, uh, a few days later, Maggie's sister, Catherine, who was age 21, she also died. And it was thought that this was a result of the grief over her sister's death. But as it turned out, she had a stomach ulcer. But isn't it a coincidence that she died just a few days later after her sister? But anyway, Absolutely. maybe the stress sort of triggered that whole situation. I don't know. Mm, mm. So anyway, the sisters are now buried side by side in unmarked graves in the Methodist section of the Drayton and Toowoomba Cemetery. Anyone in those areas might like to go and have a look. Um, and of course, as she was working for a politician, it became quite the scandal. So he sold the, the, um, the house and left the area. But, um, you know, from um, 1891 to 1984, when Lois Jackman bought the place and started restoring it, I don't know what was going on there, but from that point on, Lois was there and, um, you know, hearing all these strange noises and, uh, you know, it's quite possible that it could have been some sort of echo of uh, Maggie who killed herself, you know, and if you think about it, um, you know, of course, that would be intense, an intense experience, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yes. So that energetic recording sort of lingers around or can linger around for decades or even centuries, um, mm. you know, about around those sort of cases. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, it, there's just so many of them. That's, that's the thing. Like, you know, when I first started like doing a bit of research, I didn't have to look far, yeah. you know, and um, every town, every area, every everywhere has got has got these sort of stories you know like we're going to talk about really very few of them tonight comparatively to what's out there yeah you know and the various forms in which they take so yeah and 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 historically like that's going back a long time ago into a different time period you know obviously with different social mores and expectations of that time and you know people people committing suicide and and being killed through those expectations of the time i mean now a woman like that wouldn't have to do that you know mm, but yeah. back at that time you've got and young lives being being cut short yeah yeah exactly yeah so um so yeah i've got a, another one i'd like to talk about too which is um this is actually from john pinkney's book um haunted the book of australian ghosts mm. and it kind of it kind of dovetails onto um the the story about um fish's ghost because it's 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 kind of like this apparition appearing um you know in in a location because because a body has been in that area and this is called the policeman and the pleading specter and a particularly poignant case of murder uh in 1991 a senior police officer who had retired to Nowra in new south wales and he said that if he had reported this officially um, when he was working, his colleagues would have had him committed to a rubber room in his words. Mm. And he said, but as a trained observer with 25 years of experience, he, he didn't imagine what he actually saw. And after he'd left the New South Wales police force, he set to work building a beach shack. Um, and he was on his knees retrieving the drill when he heard a light feminine footsteps behind him, presum presumably during the day. Mm. And he turned thinking it was his wife uh, with a flask of tea, but instead it was a young blonde woman in a short dress. She looked incredibly unhappy and had an intensely pleading expression on her face. Uh, she seemed so upset, um, he opened his mouth to invite her inside. But before he could speak, she vanished 
like a light winking out before his very eyes. And the apparition, which appeared to be solid and human, next manifested itself in the shack's kitchen. And he said that his wife and himself noticed a distinct coldness in the air. There was the, that deeply anxious begging expression on the girl's face. And again, she vanished before he could speak. And later that afternoon, while they were walking on the beach, she approached them for a third time. And before I could ask her what the problem was and whether, she, whether we could help, she melted away. And during the 20 years that he owned the shack, he didn't see her again. Only on this one day did she appear. And he never forgot what he regarded as the most strangest experience in his life. Mm. And then one day after they were travelled across the lake to Conjola, the pieces seemed to fall into place. Human skeletons had been found in the Nara district and that reminded the Kanjola shopkeeper of a similar incident during World War II. He said the bones of a young woman who had disappeared in 1943 had been dug up on the beach. The place where the remains were found was so close to our shack that the policeman became convinced the image we saw was that poor girl's ghost. And he wondered whether she had been unaware that her remains had been discovered long ago and was trying desperately to direct us to where she was buried. Mm, mm. What do you make of that? Well, you know, I'm wondering, you know, did the building of that, um, the beach shack sort of disturb the young woman's ghost? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Was she trying to let him know where she was buried? Um, you know. Yeah. And why did she appear? Did she appear three times, did you say? Yeah, she appeared three times to them on, on the one day. Yeah, why do that? You yeah. Know, like, it's like, I really want you to get this, you know. Yeah, it's like she's trying to trying to trying to communicate something to them, or maybe it wasn't even so much about her remains. I mean, you know, if if the remains had been discovered um, and it was in that area, maybe it's about something else. Maybe it's about how she died. Mm. You know, maybe maybe it is about trying to connect on that level, and maybe it's an anniversary of that of that date. Yeah. You know, that's when yeah, that's when, I suppose that's a classic thing with ghosts. Is that you know we saw a ghost and it, oh, it was on this very day that he that he died. You know, in you know, 50 years ago, or whatever it is. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's very strange. Actually, there was another story. I, I actually don't remember the location at the moment because I was going to talk about that case too that you just spoke about. But um, there was a story of somewhere in New South Wales. It was near a beach and it had to do with um, people who would drive along the road there um, they would often see a woman who was dressed in a long white outfit mm-hmm. and uh, they'd, she'd sort of hail people down and she'd get into the back of the car uh, and they'd be talking to her and then they'd look in the rear view to see where she was and she'd be gone, mm. completely gone. I can't remember the name of that place. I know someone who's watching this will, but, um, yeah, like all those strange types of experiences that occur not just here. I remember that happened in... Um, in uh, uh, Japan, after the Fukushima I- uh, incident too, mm. the meltdown of the station there, and um, there were people died, of course, and um, there were reports, I remember at the time, of taxi drivers who would have people get into the back seat uh, and then they would disappear. Mm. Like, what's mm. that about, you know? Yeah, I, I I agree with you. That's I've heard so many stories like that over the years. You know, mm. you know, uh, Telly Savalas has a really famous ghost story, um, and it's it's a, it's very much along those lines. So uh, people might remember who Telly Savalas was. He was the actor who played Kojak back in the nineteen seventies. Have, have to be a certain age to remember. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So all you millennials will have no idea who I'm talking about. <laughs> And you'll definitely have to jump onto Google. But rather than have me recount that story to you now, if you get on and type in um, Tally Savalas ghost encounter, mm. it, it's a really interesting ghost encounter that really is very similar to what to what you were talking about, Cheryl. Yeah. And actually there's, um, I think we put it up on the Strange Encounters down under YouTube channel. There's also an experience that Doug, Mul- Mulray, Doug Mulray had as well. I've forgotten who he is. Was he a, was he a radio announcer or part of a band? I can't remember him now. Who, who exactly he was? But I, I remember radio announcer. A radio announcer. Yeah, might have been. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't remember. But anyway, um, he also had a um, 
a ghostly experience. So uh, jump onto the YouTube channel and sort of track down um, that story there as well. There you go. We've given you some homework. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, um, ghost experiences are really quite common. I've been to groups, you know, groups, gatherings of people at a party or just a luncheon or something like that, and it always comes up that someone has seen something strange, like an apparition, a vision, even just like a, a white sort of uh, misty thing that would appear in front of them and they've never been able to explain it, you know. Like, I think that these types of experiences are far more common than what we think. A hundred percent. I would agree with that strongly yeah yeah mm. and, and but, but because it's not in our culture we don't talk well i think people are talking about it more these days than they have there are different times mm. in in history where it's more you know you're at, you're more freer to mm. think about these things than other times um yeah. but mind you around the uh uh the uh late um late 1800s it was quite common to talk about these things you know around the victorian times it was all the rage i know they and, loved it. And they used to have seances and all that. Yeah, you bring everybody over. <laughs> spiritualism, the spiritualist movement was 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 really active at that time. Yes. And I wonder, is it the birth of um, science, you know, modern science that sort of kiboshed the whole thing, do you think? Mm, I think so. I think so. Like, um, the more they've sort of discovered about about um, about the world, I suppose, and 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 the less that people, and as, as religion has lost its grip on 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 society as well, I think the, I think you've seen that happen. I think that's you know people have have had that that transition has definitely occurred. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's no, I was just going to say like um, you don't have to go far to find someone who's had a who's had a UFO experience. Mm. You don't you can go even less distance to find someone who's had a ghost experience. Yes. You know, that's getting back to that commonality of it, that that every day you could walk down the street with a microphone talking to people and I'm sure you wouldn't, I'm sure you'd get five out of 10 people tell you that, that, that they, they've had a ghost experience or they know someone who has. Yes. Well, I was just at a luncheon yesterday and there were just 10 people there and it came up in the conversation and someone said, yes, I've seen something very strange. I don't know mm. what it was, blah, blah, blah. And they told me about it and like, you know, that's just out of 10 people one person out of 10 who was willing to talk about it. Yes. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Exactly. It's a, yeah. Yeah. It's extremely common. Um, you know, as I said, like I've, you know, I recounted my experience, you know, and, and, and people I've worked with have had ghost experiences, you know, yeah. it's, it's just, uh, it's just really a part of every day, every, it really, I I'd almost go so far as to say it, it nearly isn't across the whole scheme of things. It almost is an everyday experience across humanity is what i'm talking about you know like at some place in the world on any given moment someone is having a ghost encounter yeah and the other thing too that comes up is the fear around it because another person who was at that luncheon also uh, said uh, um they they said they don't really sort of follow it up much and i said how come and and i said you're not interested she said no i'm interested i'm just a bit fearful about it. I don't want to sort of dig into that in case I dig something up that mm. I might uh, sort of attach itself to me or, um, you know, or, or, you know, it will come up and I won't be able to get rid of it. That sort of thing might be uh, haunted by it, you know, those sorts mm. of ideas. So I think that sort of puts a, a suppresses it a lot in our society too. It does. Yeah. Don't, don't want to deal with it. You know, don't, don't want to have to face up to it. Hmm. you know perhaps 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 the world's enough to deal with without, <laughs> without okay. these things you that we know that we don't know anything about you know yeah yeah so yeah. um realms, yes yeah so i wanted to ha um have a quick ch chat about some of the haunted places in australia hmm. so and i think probably the most proclaimed famous place is the monte cristo uh homestead which is this great big victorian um, double story uh, mansion that sits atop a hill um, in New South Wales in a place called Junny or near a place called Junny in New South Wales. And it, it has a staggering amount of ghosts. But having said that, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of other, it's, it's not unique by any, by any means. It's, it's, it's just been the one that I think was famously documented by the ABC 
uh, back in the 1980s. And so many tragic things that happened at that house. Um, so I'll just go over a couple of those sort of things and people may already know some of these things that have happened. Um, but it really was um, built by a Christopher Crawley in 1884 and it passed to his, his wife Elizabeth on his death in, in 1910. So it was built in the, the latter half of the, of the 19th century. And she was devastated by her husband's death and she spent the rest of her life as a recluse. And she converted the upstairs, one of the upstairs rooms into a chapel and immersed herself into the Bible and allegedly leaving the house only twice before her death from a ruptured appendix, which would probably get you out of the house. Mm. Um, and her ghost is said to haunt her former home and the sensation of ice cold air falling like snow reportedly indicates her presence. And a chain of violent events in the house have triggered other supernatural incidents. Incidents. And a maid once plummeted to her death from the upstairs balcony. And the figure of a woman in period dress has been seen walking along the veranda to the bloodstained steps where she fell. And a stable boy was burnt to death in his bed at the hands of his master is thought to haunt the coach house. While the ghost of a mentally disabled man named Harold wanders the grounds, kept chained in the caretaker's cottage for 40 years Harold was found curled up at the feet of his mother's dead body and he died shortly after being sent to a home for the insane and the sound of clanking chains is said to warn of his approach so it's a it's it's had a whole host of of tragic events and this brings us back to what we we're talking about before tragedy mm -hmm. um heightened emotional um you know incidences that people are having death um, you know, things like that. And in fact, there's even, a strange, there's even some more strange stories about Monte Cristo. Um, when there was, a, there was a guy who I can't remember his name right now, but he, he, was, he was very keen to buy the house and he, he didn't have a lot of money and he had several attempts to buy it and eventually he did buy it. But as they were approaching the house and this house was gutted at this stage, it was absolutely gutted. It was just, just a hollow shell and vandals had been in there. It was gutted. And they're driving up to the house at night. And as they're approaching the house, every light is on in the house or light is streaming out of every window. Bright incandescent light is streaming out of all the upstairs windows, all the downstairs windows and, and streaming out into the, um, into the night. And when they get to the house, all the lights are out. And the same thing happened to their son when he drove up approaching the house as well. That, that, and this is a house that's gutted. There's no power on, there's no electricity but all the lights are, are showing. So what does that say? Is it kind of like a time set? Is it sort of like, is it kind of like reimagining itself from its, from its, mm. from its, um, from its glory days, I suppose. Mm, mm. Yeah. Very strange. I'm, I know about a house like that too. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why that happens. It's just very strange. <laughs> it's a very strange. And, and you can talk about, okay, so Monte, Monte Cristo is very famous and you know, all the ghost hunters out there will certainly know about it and, and maybe some of them have even been there um, on ghost ghost hunting or investigation. So, but it's only one location, you know, like there's other places, you know, like the old Melbourne jail, you go to Port Arthur, there's a fabulous ghost tour that you can do in Port Arthur. I've done it twice mm -hmm. and um, you'd do it three or four times if you had the chance. Like it's just great to go and hear, hear the stories of, um, of the ghosts down at Port Arthur. And if there's going to be ghosts anywhere, there'd have to be ghosts at Port Arthur. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it really is that sort of place and um, even natural places like the Devil's Pool in Queensland, which is near Cairns where 17 people have died at this natural rock pool since 1959, 17 people. Mm. And the local indigenous legend um, say it's the fault of a runaway bride named Ulana who drowned herself when she was separated from her lover. So here's this sort of, you know, classic Shakespearean type story. And she's now said to haunt the pool by seducing young men to join her in the watery grave. I mean, how good's that? It's <laughs> a good story. It's a good story, isn't it? You know, I don't and know if the if the mythology is true, but the but the facts speak for themselves that people died there. Seventeen people have died there. I mean, since nine fifty nine. Maybe it maybe it's a dangerous rock pool. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and there's an epitaph at the now fenced off pool that says he came for a visit and stayed forever. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> so I wouldn't even want to put my toe in it. No, no, that's right. You know, and even even sort of semi innocuous places like the Fremantle Art, the, the Fremantle Art Centre in Western Australia is is a highly haunted building. 
Um, you know, it's got lots of supernatural goings on. A little girl who pleads, pleads to, to, to escape from one of the old cells, an old lady who stalks the ghost tours that go through there, and even an amorous kissing ghost who will mm. plant one on your cheek at the Fremantle Arts Centre. Who would have who would have thought that? Mm. Yeah, the National Film and Sound Archive in Canberra is haunted. Yeah, yeah. And, ha- and how many hotels have got ghosts? Yes. What's that about? Pubs. <laughs> you know, pubs have always got ghosts. I went into one in Scotland. I'm sure it was haunted. There were some really weird things going on there. <laughs> Oh, wow. Have you heard of Black Mountain in Queensland? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's another one that they talk about as yeah, being yeah. being very strange. Yeah. Um, the, indig- yeah, lot- the Indigenous people don't like you crawling all over it, though. No, and for, perhaps for good reason, because they even even the European settlers said that um, people and horses and entire herds of cattle disappeared in the maze of gaps between the rocks. Well, if you see it, and you can go online and have a look at the photos, actually there's... Uh, on our Facebook page, um, there were two of the guys who went up there and they did a live from there and uh, we it was on our page. And you can see the the gaps. You could see how people can fall down. Just If they fell down there, you'd never get out and you'd never find them again. It's just, like, terrible, yeah. But, you wow. know, yeah, people do die, yeah. Yeah, I kind of had, it just sort of reminded me of Hanging Rock, you know, like, you know, it just had that sort of feel of like walking in there and disappearing, you know, never to be seen again, going into (laughs) another void, another dimension somewhere, you know, along those lines. Even Uluru Mm -hmm. has got, has got its stories of, of um, tourists who, the the local um, Anagu people are frequently overwhelmed with heavy packages filled with rocks that tourists have pocketed and then tried to apologetically return when they've noticed that their sacred souvenir has hexed them with bad luck yes. when they leave the Red Centre. Yeah, that's quite common, actually. Yeah, like you don't take any rocks from Uluru. No, yeah. don't do it. Leave them where they sit. Yep, absolutely. Take your photos, don't take the rocks. Yeah. Actually, I was just if we could just shift the conversation for a minute, I really yeah. want to talk about um, how, um, you know, I've read studies about... Um, apparitions and they've revealed that uh, people whose uh, partners, husbands, lovers, whatever, die, um, they see them mostly in the first 12 months after they die. Mm-hmm. Now, um, a psychologist would say, oh, that's the unconscious projecting them, etc." right? Well, I've heard some pretty incredible stories where these pe- some of these people who've lost a loved one, they sit down and they have very long conversations with the deceased. Um, but I actually have a friend whose husband died and she and her daughter saw uh, her ex-husband uh, the longest up to eight years. Really? Eight, eight years after he died, yeah. That's incredible. And at the last time they saw him, he said to them, I have to go now um, that the daughter um, needed to move on or something like that, yeah. So I have to go for her sake. And I, I was just blown away by that story. You know, like she said, my friend said she would see him often, you know, often and true, more in the in, when he first died. Mm, uh, but mm. they weren't married. They were they were uh, already separated by then. They weren't together. Uh, oh, all right. But um, yeah, eight years after he died was the last time that she saw him. They both saw him. Amazing. It is. Yeah. I, I, I worked with a lady once who 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 told me that too. She this is many years ago, probably nineteen ninety two. Um, and she told me that uh, after her husband died, that she had seen him around the house. Mm-hmm. And she actually told him to go away. Mm. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She told him to 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 move on, to to not to not not come here anymore. Yeah, yeah. Which I can understand that reaction too. Well, yeah, exactly. Mm. Uh, I'm just trying to think. Um, was it Raymond Moody who he's the one who coined um, the term near death experience? I think he was, was it him? I think it was. He got into psychomantiums and psychomantiums are where you, um, you know, you set up a room where it's all black and, but you have a mirror in front of you that's sort of tilted at a particular angle and you just sit there quietly uh, and just gazing into the mirror. And um, he had 
he had set up a, a, a couple of these rooms in his house for people to come and have experiences with their deceased loved ones because that's the idea is they would actually appear in the mirror. Yeah. Um, anyway, he did that. But what happened was one day um, after he'd been in his own psycho mansion, he walked out. And he, I think it was his aunt was in the in the living room and he sat and had a conversation with her for about half an hour. So <clears throat> there's something else going on there. It's not mm. about, it's not just about um, reflections and the unconscious mind, but to see them outside of that particular situation in the living room and then sit and have a conversation where you're interacting, asking questions, talking to each other. Um, that's something else again. And I wonder whether those particular, um, the psychomantians, which, by the way, are not new. I mean, they were used, you know, <laughs> many mm. hundreds of years ago mm. um, and set mm. up, um, you know, thousands of years ago, actually, uh, set up mm. in um, temples for people to go there and have their own experiences of communicating with their deceased loved ones about all types of things, you know. Mm. So, um uh, yeah, I I don't know. It's like it triggers something, some yes. sort of mechanism to come into play. Yes, it is. It's, it's and that one is almost similar to the, you know, the spectral that gets picked up in the car. You have the conversation for on a twenty minute ride, and then they've gone. So you know the 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 flesh and bloods type of appearance. Yes. You know it's. It's really, and so, so you've got ghosts who appear to family and love, well, loved ones, say primarily family, and ghosts who will appear to whoever's, whoever happens to be in the vicinity. Yes, of, a, you know, of location. Of location, bound by location. And that's yes. why I've always said that the ghost hunters have got it easier than the UFO hunters, because you can go to the, to the, to the location where, where the entity is trapped or resides by choice, whereas the, whereas the UFO investigator, they can be bloody anywhere. Yeah. you know and probably a long way from where you actually are right now so you know so that's the advantage of of, of ghost hunting over, yeah. over ufos and i have heard from some researchers that um where the ley lines cross mm. that's where you can you will often see ghosts apparitions but ufos as well and of mm. course crop circles yeah so there's something and those crop circles can be dowsable but that's a story for another time but um yeah. You know, it's like where the energy lines are, these things sort of create whirlies and they're like vortexes and they can, um, they can appear, you know, these things can appear there. It's very, very strange. It is strange, you, which makes you wonder, like, if you check ley lines to see whether Monte Cristo is on a ley line or whether Port Arthur's yeah. on a on a ley line, you know, so whether the pub down the street's on a ley line, you know, <laughs> so, you know, whether ghosts are appearing outside of that or, you know, in, under what circumstances, you know, yeah. but the thing is you can go, you can sit there, you can go there day after day and see nothing, mm. right. Or experience nothing. You have to be there at the right time on the right place. And if you have the experience, you're meant to have the experience. Mm. So have you got anything particular that you would put in your ghost hunting pack? <laughs> um well yeah i probably probably um probably a, probably garlic and a crucifix Although, <laughs> i know that's more for 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 like vampires and things but that's a really yeah. that is a really good question you know like mm. outside of because now it's, it's a very high-tech thing now you know, yeah. you, can, you can spend thousands of dollars on 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 ghost hunting and ghost detecting, and and if you've got the money to do that, well, fantastic, right? I'm 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 that's wonderful. But if you don't if you don't have the money, I would probably I would probably take the take the the if I had if I could only choose one or two things to take, it would have to be a camera and a recorder. I think I think they're the two things that you need, like you know, to try and to try and capture something. Mm. Yeah, but you can leave you can leave a trail cam lying in the bush for you know for for ages and come back and check it and see what's come onto a trail cam and I'm sure that you can do the same thing with um with you know paranormal uh, yeah. uh you know investigation as well yeah. um so and I think I think you'd probably also have to take with you a good understanding of the history of where you're going 
Yes, absolutely. You yeah. need to. Have, I think. I think you need to have that perhaps as a as an investigator, maybe above the tools even. You yeah. know, you need to know. So even if you were called out to a house and, and they said to you that, um, you know, we've just moved in here, there's a ghost here. The first thing you have to do would be go and look at the history of the house, yes. you know, go and look at that. Or if it was a different situation, that if it was my partner's passed away and now they're visiting me and, and there's that situation, we would have to say, well, let's really look at that. You know, like mm. that's you've got to look at it from, from many perspectives. Like, you know, is it the experience and not the, and not the, not the ghost too? Like maybe, maybe you can manifest it yourself. Yes, well, there's that that too, yeah. But, I, you know, I think that uh, you touched on a good point where people, you know, are willing to in invest a lot of money in, in uh, technical equipment for ghost hunting, but I, I think it's quite unnecessary. Mm, I think yeah. you've got these two ears, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, you've got your sense of um, uh, energy. You know, we, have, we all have these capabilities, our intuition, um, our instincts, paying attention, Mm. to that raising our not raising extending our um uh energetic antenna mm. I think. uh and for me i would also take a dog yes and i would take a dowser okay someone as in the 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 rods yeah someone who's good at dowsing yeah i don't think you particularly need a psychic or a medium i mean that would be useful a medium um but um Really, I think you just have to take, you know, expand your awareness. Yeah, I, I agree with that strongly. Yeah. It's, it's not, I mean, technical gear is about is about trying to find proof. And I don't think we need to find proof for ghosts. I, I think I think that people can say that you've you got to take it for, 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 almost can take it for granted now that, that there is something there, yeah. you know, and short of capturing it on a thermo image or something like that. And people still go, great, it's a thermo image. It's, you know, it's, not a man in a 17th century sailor's suit sitting on the step smoking his pipe. That's yeah. what we want to see. We don't want to see a thermal imprint on, yeah. on something. And you're right. It's more about, um, you know, using your own senses and, and, and being connected to it. Mm, yeah. So there you mm. go, folks. Make up your own list, but uh, that's what we would add to ours anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I like the dog. You know, a dog would be good. Cat would be good too. Well, yeah, I say dog because you can control the dog. You can't really control the cat. but Yeah, um, that's true. And, and you know, there's some dogs in the police have um, cadaver dogs, uh, you know, and they, if they've been trained, if there's a dead body in, in the, they'll go and lay, they'll just go lay down where the dead mm. body is. Mm. Um, not that we're looking for dead bodies, but hey, if there's a ghost, maybe there are dead bodies there. Who knows? Well, that's right. And the other thing is with ghost hunters, like it's helping the ghosts move on because that's the mm. end of the equation. It's mm. not about finding them and having a chat with them and, oh, yeah, we'll be back next week. It's not about that. I think it's about helping them move on to where they need to go next, if, if that is indeed what the case, you know. Yeah, exactly. Or in the case of an impression, if it's some sort of a psychic impression and it's going to appear there periodically from time to time, mm -hmm. then perhaps it is good to record that. Perhaps it is good to to capture the 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 pointing ghost or the the woman who's distressed down by the beach or whatever. Like you know, maybe it is it is good to capture that as 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 proof, I suppose, in that sense of the word, but um, or validation. I don't know what the right word to use is in, in that situation, but yeah, but whatever you do, have fun doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and don't have anything follow you home. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You don't. You don't want them following you home and having to close the nine circles of hell or something, you know, because you brought out the demons and things, you know. So it's well, really. Yeah, I think that the more you understand about death and what happens afterwards, the less frightened you are of those things, and the more you can. Um, feel that you can walk a steady path that where those things won't happen put it that way yeah 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 i think that's good and this is a topic that you could do another five episodes on yes you know like this is just touching the absolute thin edge of the fingernail here like you know it's it's just so much that you could go through and and i've found this one of the easiest things to research as well mm. um it's, it's just there's just so much information out there you know and i another thing i always say to people explore your local area yes explore yes. your local area it's great to have the monte cristos and the port arthurs and those sort of places but look close to home because you'll find ghosts you'll find ufos you'll find all sorts of things so always always if you're a fan of this stuff if you have an interest a passion in it always look locally 
Mm, yes, good advice. Good advice. Because mm, you will find it. Yes. <laughs> or it'll find you. Well, that's the other thing, isn't it? Yeah. It'll find you too. Yeah. You if, you, if you're open to that that idea, that interest. Yeah. Mm. Well, there you go. So that hour went quickly. I don't know where it went. <laughs> it did, didn't it? It went really quickly. <laughs> everyone, if you enjoyed uh, our little chat here, a little conversation, please like this video, give it a thumbs up. Remember to subscribe to the channel so that you get notices of um, every time we upload something so you won't miss out. So until next time, take care. And what do you say, Ben, about the Spooksters? Good luck. <laughs> okay, good luck. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>